Well, today we've got the Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, Timmy Perez Silva, joining us this morning to shed light on what transpired and about the oil and gas industry. Good morning and thank you for joining us today on the program. Good morning. All right, so if I could just start off with uh, what we have just read and seen in the news about many not quite happy, as reflected in the dailies, that uh, Labour had got to suspend the strike, albeit for two weeks. So saying, look, they should have gone on. Does this in any way, how, how do you respond or react to this when you see these headlines thinking, well, actually government was getting somewhere, but people said, no, they should have gone ahead. Well, uh, I, I really am I'm sorry that some people are disappointed, um, but I always tell such people that in the end it's about Nigeria, it's not about their interest. Um, what, were, what was the interest of, of such people to uh, see the country go in, in flames? But of course, uh, I really uh, applaud the uh, labor leaders who, who, who put Nigeria first on that uh, negotiation table. And then the other part is that they actually thought that the fuel price was going to be part of the considerations of what was going to be, a, you know, maybe reverted to what it was before, but it stays as it is, pending when some of those palliatives, as they put it, are put in place. So could you shed some light on that? How, what were the considerations before they came to that sort of agreement? No, first and foremost, I mean, we had to be very truthful about the situation uh, uh, today in the country and globally. The situation is that government could no longer go on with the subsidy because there simply was no money. If you have a situation where your earnings have dropped by 60%, then you have to do something about it. And we had to tell labor, and we had to show them uh, everything that was on the table. And they, they saw with us that it was not possible for us to, to continue. The alternative was to go back uh, to subsidy and have uh, scarcity, because there is no way government would have continued to, to subsidize uh, that product. I mean, if you have a situation where a uh, product was imported at a certain price and sold uh, at a subsidized rate, then it was at a loss. You knew that somebody was bearing that, uh, uh, that, that difference. And government was bearing that difference. And it was becoming unbearable to us because there was no way we could have uh, uh, funded that. And, and the, our earnings had dropped. I mean, you know exactly what has been happening. Oil prices came down. Um, our production actually also went down because of OPEC cuts. I mean, we are almost producing half what we used to produce at, and selling at less, less the price we, we, we used to sell it for. So in a situation like that, I think it was uh, labor saw the truthfulness uh, on, the, on the part of government. And I must say that it was a painful de decision. You, you could see it very clearly to, uh, that it was very painful. But I mean, there was no other alternative left. And we had to, we had to uh, uh, say that to them very clearly. And uh, we had to bite the bullet as a country. The challenges that a number of people might have seen, Honorable Minister, is in the way the communication came to them or the adequacy or not of the information or understanding they have of that position of government about, uh, you know, the, the hikes, hike in fuel price, hike in electricity, when there was no hike in their own income. Uh, was the... The, the communication was faulty. Is there anything being done to communicate to the lowest echelon of the people in the society so that they can take ownership of this conversation of government? Well, I, I, well, I don't know about uh, faulty communication, really. I mean, this, the, the issue is that the government announced the regulation in March this year in the heat of the COVID-19 crisis. The problem was that at that time, the government was also being applauded because prices actually came down. And then, of course, when the prices started going up, uh, it came to a point where uh, the uh, people now saw that it was, it was, it, it was uh, it, 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 and we already said from the beginning that the prices, when uh, crude oil prices went up, that we will begin to see the difference at the pump. And when that happened, 
of course, labor started kicking. But we had to tell them that already this decision had been taken a long time ago. So I don't know how we could have communicated. Everybody has his own opinion about why we should have communicated this. But I thought that uh, it was in the public domain from a long time ago that government had deregulated. I mean, from si since six months ago, government had deregulated. But then that's the, that's the thing, uh, Honorable Minister. You thought, but the people didn't get the understanding that that is going to have such a far-reaching effect on them when uh, you know, uh, crude price begins to rise. Now that the reality is there, they are feeling the pinch. So again, I ask, how do we communicate this to people so that they know that the long-term benefit if there is any, is better than the, 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 the short-term um, pinch that people are feeling now. Well, we, we, definitely, we definitely realize that this entails some pain for, for the people. But in the end, I mean, what do you do? If you have a child that is, uh, that is ill that needs to go for surgery, I mean, you cannot, because he's going to have pain, uh, decide to uh, avoid the surgery. I mean, this uh, surgery needs to be, uh, uh, to be, to be, to be done. Uh, this su successive administration, successive governments in this country have tried to achieve it, and it's because everybody knew that this was the way to go. Unfortunately, it was not possible at that time, but I think at this point, uh, everybody now knows there's a consensus around it, especially uh, uh, um, within, among the people that are well-meaning Nigerians, that this is the way to go. And uh, of course, I don't know exactly how you expect us to communicate this, but what we told them was that, look, we have an alternative now. Uh, if you want to create a, a toll gate somewhere, the law is that you create an alternative. We created that alternative. The alternative is to give another form of fuel, which is gas. And we're going to roll out that in the next few days. And we felt that that is going to cushion the effect in the long run. Apart from that, we believe that deregulation is also necessary because it's going to really grow the refining sector. I mean, if you ask the question, why has the refining sector not grown? Why, has people, why have people not invested in this sector? You will realize, you will come invariably to the conclusion that it was because that, that, that sector was actually a subsidized sector. And there's nobody that will come with investment and build a refinery and then now sell the product at a subsidized rate. If you look at it, I mean, there are a lot of people who uh, made subsidy claims I mean, for the past five years, they are still waiting for their subsidies claims to be paid. I mean, you cannot invest money and expect that when you produce, you sell at a subsidy, and then you wait for government to pay you that uh, uh, difference, and then you wait indefinitely for that payment because the money was simply not there. It was not possible to carry on with this, and we, we, we actually told them, and we believe that well-meaning Nigerians have understood it. I, we understand that there is no way we can explain this to the understanding of certain people, certain naysayers. There is no way you can ever explain it to the understanding of those other people. But well-meaning Nigerians have gotten the message and are with us. You know, I think well-meaning Nigerians will also like to know if the government is still subsidizing petrol in any way. Uh, well, I, I don't know what other definition I'll give to deregulation uh, uh, versus subsidy. We have said that we have deregulated. Uh, that means that uh, we are out of subsidy completely. We are not subsidizing uh, PMS anymore. We are actually trying to introduce an alternative fuel, which will even be cheaper in the long run than, fuel, than, uh, than PMS. But when you say, I mean, during that, the last, the one before this, the, the meeting that the federal government had with Labour, you said that the government, uh, we have not fully deregulated because of the concerns the government has for Nigerians. In fact, you went on to say that the price of fuel could go up to 183 naira per liter, going by the current rate of the dollar, which is why I ask, is there still any form of subsidizing still going on? And like you said, it has not been fully deregulated. Well, well, no, at that time, what I meant was that we were transitioning and, you know, we didn't go to the full extent because you see that the, the subsidy was taking place at two ends. At the pump, we were subsidizing and at the FX end, we were also subsidizing. So you have to access, uh, NMPC accessed FX at a lower rate and imported the product. 
And then at the pump, we also further subsidized. So at this point, what we were saying uh, to, to, to them, uh, I remember in uh, that occasion, was that the FX situation, if you look at the FX situation, where we are, where, where we were, where was, still, was still not the, where we, we should be. But because we were mindful of the fact that, fact that we were transitioning from a subsidy situation to a, a deregulated situation, we needed to tamper the situation. And government was still taking a little bit of, of, of that FX subsidy, at least the, the burden of that FX subsidy. And of course, we want, to, we want to carry on with this for a while until we're able to, uh, to, to roll out the alternative fuels so that Nigerians can, can move on to that alternative. And then we know that we would, have completely, we, would get, we would have gotten to a point where we can actually back out fully. But at the FX level, level, if you look at the situation today, and if you do the math, you'll find out that we are still not exactly where we should be. I, I say that, yes. So, so that is to say that the government is still, in some sense, subsidizing, well, at the FX level, maybe not well, at the well, pump I will, price. I will say, I will say, we're, we're, I, I would rather say the government is just transitioning. Well, because subsidy basically means you get things cheaper. There's someone paying for it, so you as a consumer, you're getting it cheaper. So in the regard of the FX, just to, I mean, like you said, communication is key. Just to allow Nigerians to understand where we are right now. So when they look at the news, they say, okay, well, I understand what the government is doing. So to that extent, the government is still involved in, in, in the petroleum sector, at least in that area. No, at, the, at, the at, the time, at, at the time I was speaking... We were at that point, but at this point, I, 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 we, are, we, are, we, are, we are completely we are completely out of subsidy. So, what is going to happen to the equalization fund, the functions of the PPP, RA, and sundry agencies that perform those functions? Uh, well, of course, uh, the PIB will take care of that. Uh, if you if you uh, if you were watching, the PIB is already with the National Assembly. With the passage of the PIB, uh, we believe that uh, those agencies will not exist exactly uh, as, they, as they are today. But uh, let's wait for the PIB to be passed uh, by the National Assembly. To that, the, the PIB, but we just want to follow up on some of the circumstances concerning or surrounding how uh, the petrol price stays and labor's request to put in some palliatives to cushion the effects. Um, one of the concerns or options raised was that the refineries have got to work. And one wonders, what's the thinking? Because, I mean, it takes years, some say minimum of two, three years, to get the refineries working. What do you plan to achieve, or what is the committee going to be considering in two weeks, with which Labour says, after which, if they don't see those signs, they may just get back to the strike? I don't think Labour is expecting to see all the refineries fixed in two weeks. Uh, Labour is quite realistic. But what we told them was that, look, the refineries, we understand that this has uh, been a big, uh, uh, a big problem in the country, uh, the fixing of the refineries. But when you even look at it, uh, look at it from the historical uh, basis, you also realize that the fixing of the refinery the, or the non-functioning of the refinery was also due to the fact that there was subsidy. Because you have a situation where a refinery was not operating optimally. You, uh, you refine product and you sell at a loss, um, if you have to put it uh, bluntly. So these refiners could not have functioned. Uh, optimally and commercially. With deregulation now, uh, we believe that uh, the refineries can now function optimally because they can now, uh, it's, it's, I, I always say it's a chicken and egg situation. What do you do? Do you want your refineries to function after deregulation or before deregulation? I think in this situation, we uh, believe that uh, the, this, this policy direction will help the functioning of the, of the refineries as well. I haven't said that. I also say, look, we have a timeline. We, we, told, we gave Labour a clear timeline uh, for fixing these refineries. We are, taking, we are signing the EPC for Portaco refinery by December this year. And we believe that by uh, end of next year, 2021, 50% of uh, the Portaco uh, will be ready 50%. And then by 2022, 
the uh, protocol refinery rehabilitation would have been through. And then, of course, we, we will go on uh, to worry refinery. Of course, the processes are also on, and we give labor a clear timeline, and they saw the workability of this timeline. You know, for a lot of Nigerians, they keep wondering, why can't our refineries work? Is this rocket science? A lot of reasons have been given. Well, funds, uh, for example, mismanagement and what have you. But it appears as though this government is trying to, you know, tackle that head on. You have said that the country loses, uh, well, at some point we're losing a billion naira a day to subsidy. Now that that has been scrapped to an extent, does that mean that the monies that we're meant to use to subsidize is being, for example, channeled into those refineries? Well, I, we, we, look, we have already gotten the funding for the refineries. I mean, that's a separate situation. We're not waiting because this, we are saying that the, the savings is going, to be, uh, is going to be gradual and it's going to be plowed back into the development of, 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 of infrastructure and other sectors. Uh, we've not ring-fenced that uh, savings to, to pump into just the refineries. But the refineries are a commercial venture now. That is the way we look at them. We look at the refineries based on the, the, the regulation. We, have, we are seeing the refineries as a commercial venture that will be funded commercially. You know, the refineries, the Port Harcourt refinery, you said by December it should have reached 50%. So when are we, when will no, no, be no. 100%? I said, I said that the EPC will be, I said the EPC will be signed by December this year. And then by 2021, we would have reached 50% of the rehabilitation of Port Harcourt refinery. Okay, well, still talking about refineries, the, um, part of the agreement with labor is... Um, um, item number six under the deregulation of the uh, under the downstream sector deregulation, uh, the, the agreement talked about the federal government facilitating the delivery of licensed modular and regular refineries. Uh, uh, that's also a conversation that's been on for some time. Some had thought that with those ones actively working, we will probably have some significant uh, quantity of refined product in Nigeria as opposed to the imported ones. That, that will help, I mean, but I, I always say that uh, modular refineries uh, will not be a complete solution to the problem. Um, but we have, we have Dangote refinery also coming up, which uh, we believe is going to be a big part of the, of, of, of the solution. Dangote refinery alone is 650,000 barrels a day. Then you have Potaco refinery, 250,000 barrels, with another refinery being planned for Potaco also, which is 100,000 uh, barrels, which means that will bring down the uh, capacity of Port Harcourt to 350,000. Then you have Worry Refinery and, uh, and the Kaduna Refinery. By the time all these refineries come on stream, we will have uh, an in-country in refining capacity that will be able to cater for the needs of Nigeria and will become even a net exporter of this product. By the time those refineries come on stream, now, that, that's the active statement for me. And like I said in the previous statement, if you say that the Port Harcourt refinery will be ready by, I mean, 50% ready by December 2021, when will it be 100% ready as well as other refineries? It will be by 2022. I said it will be ready by end 2022, Port Harcourt refinery will be, will be ready. Right. So that means that the other refineries might take even longer? Well, it's, it's about the same timing, but of course, uh, those processes are also still on, but I'm just beginning uh, from Portaco because we need to sequence it properly. We don't want to handle everything at the same time because that, was, that is the mistake that uh, uh, previous uh, administrations have been making. And of course, please, you have to be patient with us and allow us to do it properly and deliver these refineries to you in due time. Yeah, speaking of which, I mean, I think in 2018, there was an agreement that was signed, I think, between uh, Nigeria and Niger Republic. Uh, there was supposed to be a refinery, I think, in Mashe, between the border, uh, Katsina and uh, uh, Niger Republic. What's going on with that? Because it was supposed to be, I think, the third largest refinery after Dangote and Portaco refinery. Uh, those discussions are still ongoing, but I, I believe there is a problem around the supply of feedstock from uh, Niger. I mean, they are talking to their partners. You know, the, the problem, uh, they have a different uh, system in Niger where their partners uh, 
uh, take most of the product, most of the crude oil out of out of the country. So we are still discussing with them on how to get those refineries, uh, uh, well, those refineries started. That refinery started. Sorry. So what was the target date now? If you succeed with that kind of conversation. I don't have a target date for you because the conversations haven't gotten there yet. Because okay. we have to guarantee fit stock for the refinery before we can begin the conversation about target, target dates. But you, you know, yes, we have those plans. And looking into the future in terms of mid and long term, you wonder just how viable will oil be? I mean, you've talked about that time and again. How viable oil will be, let's say, in the next 50 years. Yes, we're building those refineries. But what is the plan, really, if in the next 50 years, attention will be shifting away from petrol uh, what would happen to those refineries, for example? Well, I'm sure that uh, the, uh, the investors uh, have already uh, done their feasibilities and uh, they probably would have gotten their numbers right before they are investing because uh, I don't really, I can't say what is going to happen to those refineries. But the projection is that, like I said, oil is uh, going to be uh, uh, responsible for less and less of the en energy mix uh, by in 20, in, in 20 years' time. I mean, that is the project projection. And uh, uh, you see uh, uh, Europe and the Western world are trying to move to alternatives. But of course, we here, uh, because of that, we are also transitioning uh, into, uh, to gas. We want to see how we can begin to... Uh, um, increasingly utilize gas as our alternative fuel, and then we'll probably move from there to alternatives as well. Of course, you know that the energy world is always changing, and we are, we are quite mindful of that. But today, uh, we still need petrol, and we will, still, we will invest uh, in our refineries because we still require the petrol. When that time comes, uh, when it comes that petrol is no longer uh, the dominant fuel, uh, we will know exactly what to do at that time. As at August this year, uh, there are about 27 valid refinery licenses, and uh, many of which, from what we see here, are still valid. And then, usually, there are questions as to why is it that when government issues these licensing rounds, many get these licenses, they're not able to complete some of these things. What's government doing about this? Well, I will ask you that question. Why are those refineries not able to take off? It is very clear. The okay. environment was not uh, conducive for investment because of mm. subsidy. I mean, you, 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 exactly, you, know, you, you should know the answer to this. I mean, it was not possible for them because you give licenses. People thought, oh, they can develop these license, licenses. Then when they do, do the numbers, the numbers don't add up because of the subsidy situation. So all the refinery licenses that were not given were not able to take off. But now with deregulation, we are beginning to see a renewed interest in the development of refineries in Nigeria. And we believe that with this, uh, with deregulation, you will see that uh, that uh, will, 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 will be a thing of the past. People will develop that sector because private investment, private uh, capital will come in uh, easily to that sector and develop it. I mean, you can see what is happening in the telecom sector is likely to happen in the refining sector. What is also happening in the banking sector, you see exactly what happened when uh, those sectors were deregulated. We believe that that is also going to happen in this sector and create a lot of opportunities and jobs for Nigerians. Well, Honorable Minister, could you shed some light on the bosses that the uh, ministry or the government will be making available to labor? Well, yes, that has happened before and many saw the way that went. So one wonders, rather than give those bosses, CNG could be, to labor, what's wrong in, in encouraging states to have a viable or functional transport system which will stand the test of time? Because people may say there's a labor may have their shortcomings with these bosses. Uh, we, uh, well, um I agree that uh, this problem doesn't end, uh, begin and end with labor, uh, but uh, the intention is to give labor first, uh, some uh, buses, uh, up to 133 buses, 
and then we expect to go down like you are suggesting uh, to uh, capture other states and other uh, Nigerians. We, uh, we believe that uh, the immediate uh, impact of uh, fuel, the rise in price of fuel, I mean the increase uh, occasioned by deregulation is on transportation and that's why we decided to uh, intervene in this sector first. Uh, but the difference now is that these buses are going to be gas powered. Uh, that means the running cost of these buses is going to be lower and it will be cheaper. Um, there are private sector people who have also uh, uh, volunteered to, be, to participate in the program to bring in a lot more buses. Uh, the buses, I mean, will, it will not end with just this uh, first set of buses that will be given out to labor. Um, uh, private individuals and other well-meaning Nigerians will come into the uh, program and uh, bring in a lot of gas powered buses that is going to uh, bring down the, uh, the, the price of transportation. I mean, definitely it is known that uh, if uh, gas, 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 gas powered uh, buses run uh, a lot more efficiently and cheaper. Uh, Dangote, for example, uh, uh, converted all his trucks to gas and that brought down his uh, operating cost by up to 50%. And we believe that. Uh, these buses will be cheaper to run and uh, it will actually stabilize the, uh, the transportation sector. Right. Now, two issues come up. I know that this is a drive. This is a major drive that you are you're pushing and, you know, talks about green energy. It's cheaper, of course, and a couple of other benefits. But the, 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 the agreement with Labour says that those buses will be made available immediately. Has that been done? Yes, they will be made. Yes, definitely. Uh, we, well, when you say immediately, I mean, it doesn't mean that it, it will be done yesterday, but we believe that within the next one month, that uh, uh, promise will be fulfilled to labor. Now, and that will be immediate enough. Okay, well, different definitions of immediately, obviously. But the other side to that question is conversion. So if we're saying that we're moving into that phase where cars can run on gas, the average Nigerian has a car that runs on petrol, some diesel. So what's the plan really to transition into that phase? Well, uh, already there are a lot of private sector people that are partnering with us and they are bringing in uh, the conversion kits. Um, government is going to take the cost of conversion, but uh, uh, because of the uh, participation of a lot of uh, private sector people and the enthusiasm that we've seen in private sector, we believe that we can achieve this transition um, very, uh, very quickly. We will, we will transition to, that, uh, to the usage of gas very quickly. When you say the government will take up the cost, does that mean if I want to uh, convert my car, it will be free of charge? Yes, exactly. That's what we mean. We, we mean that we will have accredited uh, uh, stations for converting, and if you go to those stations to convert, you will convert for free. How long is this free period, really? Is it for as long as, I mean, foreseeable future or for a certain period of time? Because I imagine a lot of people asking questions now. For, no, for the foreseeable future, because we, we, we know that this is going to be an additional cost and government feels that we, we can take this cost from them. And then at least to encourage the process of converting as well, we're expecting to take this cost from uh, the ordinary Nigerian that wants to convert his car. Mm. So I'm thinking there's still a lot of questions. What will the process be like? Do I need to apply? Uh, do I just need to go to the, to the, to the centers? Just no, take uh, my well, car? Uh, we, 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 what, what we will do, we will advertise the conversion centers everywhere. Everybody will know that there are accredited conversion centers because what we don't want is for quacks to get into this conversion business and create problems for us. So there will be accredited conversion centers and this, uh, the addresses will be put out and then everybody uh, can go to those centers and convert their vehicles. So how soon will this start? Pardon me, this is this is big deal, really, because we're moving into a new phase. So how soon will this start? Yes, and just is, how much it, it will it cost deal, the government? Yes. Mm. Um, well, uh, 
we haven't looked at it from that uh, point of cost, but I, I told you, for example, that there are a lot of private sector people that are willing to come into to this business. You know exactly, I mean, you ask uh, MTN how much it costs them to uh, take away uh, the cost of, of SIM cards. In the end, there are people who are interested in selling the gas. So if they convert your car, over time they can recover uh, the cost of your conversion from selling gas to you. The same way MTN can recover the cost of their SIM card from your uh, recharging your SIM card. I mean, I, I guess that is the way it will go. Well, uh, Honorable Minister, pardon me to take you back for just a little bit. Uh, we talked about the refineries just before we went on break, but someone just sent a, a message in asking, uh, what happened to the turnaround maintenance, the money budgeted for turnaround maintenance for all refineries in the country in the first term of this government? Uh, frankly, I can't give that answer now, but uh, right now we're not talking about turnaround maintenance. We're talking about rehabilitation. I mean, the, the situation is that these refineries have got into a state where it is not just turnaround maintenance that these refineries require. It is outright rehabilitation, and that is where we are. I really uh, can't uh, say from the back of my, uh, my hand what uh, 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 amounts were budgeted earlier for turnaround maintenance and where that money is. Okay. So, but will there be, uh, would you be getting back to us regarding that? Because, I mean, it's, it's a huge deal. These are resources, the country's resources that have been budgeted for that purpose. So, uh, how would we know what happened to them? Okay, I can check and uh, get back to you on that. Right. Now, when you've been busy recently with the PIB, for example, and, I mean, you had to debunk saying that the NMPC will not be scrapped. But there are other questions, and you have privy to what is in that bill, what a lot of Nigerians don't know. So we'd like to glean from you what is there. So really, what is the game changer about this? You've talked about the Petroleum Equalization Fund and the PPPRA. I believe that they will not exist anymore as they are right now as a result of uh, the PIB. What do we expect? Well, I, I, I will not want to be dragged into discussing the PIB yet because it has not been uh, uh, presented uh, on the floor of the House, but we expect that uh, the PIB is going to make uh, Nigeria a more interesting destination. I mean, if you look at it for the past 20 years, we've not had any significant uh, investment in the oil sector. Uh, we've not had many significant investments in the oil sector because of the uncertainties around the uh, amendment of the law. Uh, but today, uh, once the PIB is passed, I mean, we will have that certainty introduced and uh, we, we, we believe that there will be a lot of investments uh, in, into Nigeria in the oil sector. Uh, that is one of the changes that we expect that the, the passage of the PIB will bring. And also, uh, one of the bigger thing, uh, big things that will happen is also the development of the midstream sector. The midstream sector was actually absent in Nigeria uh, because of the absence of, uh, of uh, fiscal terms for the uh, mid, uh, midstream. But now the PIB is going to introduce those terms and uh, we believe that uh, that sector will also grow exponentially. Well, Honorable Minister, we began this conversation by talking about the, the fact that there is a need to converse with Nigerians so that they can take ownership of and buy into the policies of government. It might just be a good idea to which give is us what just a doing. glimpse. Yes, which is what we're doing now. You've talked about the, this midstream sector being created, upstream, midstream, and downstream. So it, it'll be good to know how this midstream will benefit Nigerians in the long run, not just bringing in the investment, but how will it benefit the ordinary Nigerian on the streets in the different parts of the country because I think this will also help them to understand what government is doing for them so that when there is ag agitation for passage of the PIB, they themselves can understand and then they can buy into it. So could you please give us some education? Well, let me just give you an example with pipelines which constitutes the part of the midstream, pipelines. The problem with the, uh, uh, the downstream sector in Nigeria has been, well, with most of the, uh, pe the uh, petroleum sector in Nigeria, it's actually the health of our pipelines. Now you have a pipeline uh, that takes crude from the south to Kaduna refinery. That pipeline has never been healthy because, of course, there are a lot of breaches along the way. 
Now, with the midstream uh, properly developed, it means that people can own those pipelines so that you actually decouple the pipelines from the refinery so that the owner of the ref refinery is not saddled with the responsibility of also managing that long length of pipeline. So a Nigerian who wants to invest in pipeline in a pipeline network can just invest in a pipeline network and focus on the security of that pipeline. So you can imagine that that is going to allow the refineries to function better because the pipelines will be owned separately from the refineries and Nigerians can invest separately in the pipelines. So you can see how pipeline development, and if you free up that space, it's going to really help the growth of this, uh, of this industry. For example, I can now go to an estate and build a grid, a pipeline grid for gas. And then, of course, I will just I will pipe the, the, the gas to the homes in that place. Well, we, if it's an estate, I build the pipeline grid within the estate. And then I pipe the gas to the homes. And I just sit there, and then I put the gas straight to the homes, and people will, of course, get the, the, the gas delivered in their homes. And I sit back, and I just uh, collect the, uh, the, 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 the tariff from their usage of the gas that is piped through my pipeline. I don't even have to own the gas. But once I, I own the pipeline, that now will open that space, and a lot of investment will come. So you see that. Uh, the, the midstream sector, which of course uh, constitutes a pipeline network, will really help the health of, the, of, of, of this industry. That's just an example, for example. For, that's just an example. Well, there is, there is also the this CNG uh, that you, you're, you're talking about now. Uh, is it part of the? I imagine that is, is the part of the larger plan of what you call the National Gas Expansion Program that's included in the Economic Sustainability Plan, is it? Yes, uh, CNG is, we have three streams of gas. You have the CNG, compressed natural gas, LPG, and LNG. Uh, and these are all going to be delivered. So you can either convert your car to CNG, you can convert your car to using LNG, LPG, or you can convert your car to using LNG. Okay, now, uh, the Economic Sustainability Plan has that component of uh, the CNG and the number of project elements that are there, and uh, the implementing structure of government is the Federal Ministry of Petroleum Resources and the Nigeria National Petroleum Corporation, NNPC. Could you give us a picture of what, how far is that going to go? Because we understand it's to maximize domestic use of CNG while reducing reliance on refined petroleum products like kerosene and PMS that you have talked about earlier. Uh, how far reaching will the conversations be, especially with the states in the various subnationals? Well, uh, uh, it is not just CNG, it is CNG, LPG, and LNG. But also, if you look at the uh, economic sustainability plan, it's not just about auto gas. It's also about, it's, totally, it's about our gas penetration in Nigeria. If you look at household gas, we are also uh, not really in a good place in Nigeria. We, are one, we have one of the lowest gas penetration in Africa. And we are not talking about the world now. We're talking about Africa. We have one of the lowest gas penetration. So uh, this, uh, we, the uh, economic sustainability uh, plan is not only looking at auto gas, it's also looking at how we can get more households to use gas uh, as, as, uh, uh, for, 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 for domestic purposes. Uh, so we are going to have MDCs, for example. That's another leg of this program. We are talking about auto gas now uh, because of deregulation. But the, we are going to have micro distribution centers in various parts of Nigeria and allow people to access domestic gas easily and cheaper so that uh, uh, we can encourage the use of gas uh, in the, even in the rural areas. For now, what we are seeing is that a lot of people are discouraged to use gas uh, in their households because of the, uh, the upfront capital outlay. First, you have to buy the cylinder. You have to buy uh, the, uh, the gas stove. And in the end, you are investing over 70,000 naira just to be able to have uh, uh, to be uh, to cook uh, to have the uh, cooking uh, utensils. I mean the, the gas uh, stove and the and the cylinders. 
Now, what we are trying to introduce is a situation where you go to an MDC. The MDC, which is a micro distribution center, you actually uh, pay for a rental. You have to, instead of buying the cylinder, you actually rent the cylinder. And then, so you, that initial capital outlay will be reduced. And then you take the gas home. Then before also, when, your gas, uh, when, you, when, you, when you run out of gas, you go out and you have to order a full gas cylinder. This time we are also going to introduce the fractional filling so that you can go and you can fill half a bottle, you can fill a quarter, and then so, so people can use it. Before now, people, uh, people can only do that with kerosene. You go, you, if you don't have enough money, you buy half a liter, you can buy a bottle of kerosene, you can even buy half a bottle. But we are also introducing this fractional filling in that household gas usage sector. And we believe that that is going to also encourage the use of gas in the rural areas and it will improve our penetration. It's a holistic program. It is not just autogas. Um, when we are rolling out, we are rolling out autogas uh, um, in a few weeks, in a few days from now. Uh, and by end of October, we'll also be rolling out the uh, uh, LPG for households. But the concerns that they had about uh, appropriate pricing for gas and gas flaring, how have those been addressed? Well, uh, we, we believe that when we start the process, it's going to really, I mean, it's, 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 it's a matter of demand and supply. Uh, right now, uh, the, the, the supply, a lot of this gas is being exported. We are trying to bring all that uh, gas back into the country. And when we have enough gas in the country, it's going to push down the, the price of gas as well. well. The ESP says it's a 12-month plan. Uh, are we hopeful that before August next year, this is all, all over the place? Well, well we, we, will, we will make a start, and we believe that uh, by that time, things would have taken root and things would have uh, orbited. That means they can actually move on their own. We, 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 are, we are actually, the economic, economic sustainability plan is actually uh, a reaction to, COVID, to the effect of COVID-19. We believe that uh, Nigerians have the resilience to stabilize quickly, and once uh, the situation stabilizes, they don't even need uh, uh, these interventions anymore. Mm. Can we achieve all of this without steady power supply? Uh, frankly, I don't want to go into discussing the power sector here. I am not competent to discuss the power sector because you know that uh, that is uh, within the purview of another ministry. I, I know, Honorable Minister, but I mean, it will hugely affect all the plans that you've got. So if that is not there to rely on, a lot of this but we are, also work, we, are, we, are, we are also we are also working on uh, stabilizing power definitely as a government i can tell you that okay because i know that there have been several targets that have not been met and so there will always be concerns and questions as to how do we ensure that these targets can indeed be met so that everyone wants to be happy with this plan but, but 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 as i said i mean you have the chicken and egg there too I mean, how do you start the power sector? Is it growing? Is, is it not growing because uh, the tariff system is not supporting uh, the uh, the inflow of capital into the sector, or is capital is the capital inflow going to uh, make the sector grow? I mean, you have to look at it from both ends and uh, see whether uh, the uh, increase in tariff will actually help the growth of that sector or not. Well, there's a bit of confusion at the moment. I know you talked about the PIB, how uh, the PIB will address the PPPRA, the PEF, which may not exist in the way it is. But people are confusing. But they thought the president just reappointed the PEF boss. And so if the PIB will address this, what do we expect? Well, it is still existing now until the uh, PIB is passed. Uh, so if... Uh, it was reappointed. I mean, it, it, it just means that it will continue until the PIB is passed. So should the, the employees of, of those agencies be worried, as it were, with this PIB? Because as you'll understand, there'll be some kind of apprehension hearing some of this news filtering in. So what should they know right now? No, the, 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 the employees have no need to worry at all because that has been... Uh, envisaged by the PIB, and uh, the, nothing will happen to the employees at all.
Right. Now, in, in terms of certifying which filling stations will, will dispense uh, the, the, the LPG, LNG, and, uh, and what have you, you know, there, there are filling stations, for example, that are close to residential areas, and you know there's that drive for them to naturally want to be a part of this. So in terms of giving some form of certification to those filling stations, what are the considerations being made? Well, DPRO will actually uh, uh, do, do that job uh, to ensure that uh, uh, filling stations uh, uh, meet with all the uh, uh, meet all the conditions before they can install LPG or N LNG or CNG. I know that you also talked about there's been different drafts over the past 20 years of this PIB, and so it got so many people confused. But in terms of still speaking about what to expect from this one when it does fly, several stakeholders they suggest that. They would like to see a provision in the PIB that will allow for uh, cash call payments for JVs as a first line charge at the Federation account. Will that happen? Well, uh, as, as I said earlier, I do not want to go into details uh, of the PIB. Uh, it will soon be a public document. And uh, of course, uh, there will be opportunities uh, during the public hearings for the public to express their opinion. So should they, would they be expected to express opinion in terms of whether or not they will see specified in the PIB the processes for licensing rounds, who owns them, and where it goes? Should they expect to debate on that as well? It's, it's, it's a democracy. I mean, once uh, the National Assembly uh, starts with the public hearings, uh, I believe that Nigerians will be free to express their opinion in every uh, aspect of the PIB. Because some people are wondering what happens to landowners, for example, in those areas where, you know, there are, there are pipelines, and you say Nigerians can invest also. So they're asking, in fact, there are a couple of questions that have been sent in that, what happens to us? Uh, will there be an agreement we'll have with those investing, or will that be outrightly, you know, be managed by the government? Yeah, you're, actually, you're actually asking these questions uh, as if we are at the public hearing already. Well, you understand that Nigerians... Yeah, are, 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 you, yes. The truth is Nigerians want to know at least what is in that package so they know how to approach it moving forward. And like, like we said, as much as, yes, there will be a process to it, you are privy to those information. So we don't begin to have the wrong information spread around. It is always good to have you clear the air so the wrong things are not pushed out. No, it, it, it's important to... It, it, to sequence things properly. I mean, if uh, the PIB is already with the National Assembly, it's not in my place to announce uh, the details of the PIB. The National Assembly is going to uh, read the, uh, the, 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 the letter of co communicating the PIB to them today, I believe. And if they do that, it will be in the public domain. So why, why are we in a hurry? Let's just be patient, and the, the PIB will be in the public domain very, very soon. All right. Uh well, it's just good. I mean, you talked about this being a public hearing. I'm wondering, this is public. The public is watching, but let's leave. And they can't hear us. But let's take this. Uh, uh, forgive me. Let me take you back to uh, the, what you said about the CNG buses to labor. There are three steps in that uh, in that particular item on that on that agreement with labor said that the buses will also be dispensed to major cities and then to all the states and have conversations started with the subnationals because that partnership uh, will definitely be very relevant if uh, the plan is to be sustained so what's the conversation with the states uh, to ensure that this mass system works and is sustainable I, I believe the governors are already uh, on board, I believe. I, I, I think that uh, uh, everybody understands that this is a necessary uh, policy direction, and uh, we will start at the, uh, at the national level, and uh, the states will also uh, take it up from there. All we need to do is to ensure that, um, for us, our interest now is to ensure that people can have gas in the stations. And that's what we are really uh, concerned with now. Uh, we will roll it out in the next few days, and we expect that um, it will also uh, be rolled out in, uh, at the state levels and even at the local gov uh, government levels in the coming uh, months and uh, uh, coming weeks. All right, then. We'll look forward to seeing how all of these uh, policies crystallize 
to the benefits of all. We do thank you for coming on, uh, Honorable Minister for Petroleum, Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, uh, Timmy Perez Silva. Thank you for talking to us today, and we wish you all the best. Thank you. All right, and don't forget, we did put out a poll. Um, haven't seen how some persons were responding to some issues about labor, whether or not they should have called off, no, suspended. That's the word labor used. They say, no, it, it's suspension, not called off. So in their words, should they have suspended the strike? Just hit any of those buttons and then tell us. We'll have to collate your thoughts. So we're going to go let them know, even if it's a cross-section of Nigerians who are voting.